Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Uh, you guys are able to hear me in the back? Awesome. So I know I'm the only person standing between you and lunch. Uh, and this is also a crisp talk. I only have 15 minutes, so I'll, and I have quite a bit of content to present. I'll rush through. I'll probably take questions at the end after the talk during the lunch, okay? So the topic is about how we made everybody at Index, developers, uh, also take care of the infrastructure, okay? The lessons we learned, what was what pushed us into that sort of zone, and how we ended up being where we are today. And what are some of the key takeaways that you can have if you want to follow a similar kind of a practice in your organization. So, my name is Ashwant Kumar. Uh, I'm a principal engineer at Index. It's just a fancy word for saying I also write code at Index. Um, so that's my Twitter handle, underscore Ashwant Kumar. Feel free to ping me. Uh, I'm a little late. I still use a Windows phone, so I don't get real-time updates on Twitter handles, but I'll keep checking them often, so I'll respond. Um, and yes. So the just getting into the talk. So there are three stages. I would like to classify the uh, Index has grown into the way we do operations today in three parts, the early stage, the growth stage, and the later stage, which we are in right now. I'll walk you through each of them. Um, in the early stage, the overall goal for us when we started the company was just to have a working infrastructure. Uh, like how Kiran talked about, they just needed to quickly get up and running, and like any, any other startups would just want, how do we get up and started and start delivering value to our customers, right? And we were, we were around five to 15 developers, um, and we used to have one to two member uh, operation teams, uh, I mean, ops team members. Uh, the one person was a developer who had to become an operational person because somebody has to take care of the infrastructure. And the other one was on and off, we had some contractors, we tried with remote people and then it was still fluctuating. Um, and the responsibilities included, they had to write uh, deployment scripts uh, for their whole setup, um, both internal and the open source tools. The, by open source, they mean like we started off using Hadoop, HBase, the whole big data stack. I mean, not the whole, but the starting off with them. Um, so they had to start writing uh, the, in the code for managing and deploying them. And they had a centralized control on AWS because I still remember the days when we had CloudWatch alarms when our AWS bill used to touch $1,000 uh, in the early days. Uh, now we have like 10, 20 times over that. But at that time, we wanted to have a control for who gets to access those resources and how I manage them. And that sort of also influenced our choice of tools. If you can see, okay, this is the, on, on the top. Uh, of course, we were using AWS, but predominantly in the AWS, one tool that we used the most was the management console. That launch instance button was the lifesaver on those at like two o'clock in the night when you had to bring up an instance and deploy a code so that you can get, uh, show that to your, um, I mean, if our, when our CEO was at US, when trying to show the app to the uh, potential investor, you want to have something working. Uh, all, screenshots doesn't always sell, uh, you know, for most long. Uh, and that was a very important tool in our stack. And because the whole culture of having a centralized responsibility uh, and control was there, we were using uh, Chef, uh, where the ops team used to manage the provisioning, so it was more of a pull-based system. They would update their cookbooks or recipes and would get pulled on the individual servers eventually and then get updated. Uh, and the third one was the Capestrino which is what we used our deployment scripts. Uh, it was also written in Ruby because Chef was also in Ruby. Um, and the last one is the GoCD. We are a huge fan of uh, ThoughtWorks products because a lot of our core team were from ThoughtWorks, so we use a lot of their open source tools. So uh, GoCD is from ThoughtWorks that we use for our CI and CD process. Um, so this is how it started. And the re lessons we learned in that was operations team couldn't really scale. Um, and they cannot also, I mean, okay, so the first one was this, oh, they couldn't really contribute to our system design or architecture uh, because they were always overloaded with ad hoc requests. Uh, we'll look into what of them eventually. And the kind of mentality that we had initially was they would be the first on-call support. If something used to go down, for the minimum level of alerting that we had, they would get calls and they would have to go debug a system at 3 a.m. in the morning without having much context. Like that really wasn't useful because they, they would be trying to fiddle out the logs, try to make sense of what this log meant, why is there a, and I mean, if you guys have worked with Java, you know the size of the error stack that it generates and it's not much useful if you, are, if you don't have a, a developer background on where this is coming from or what this is being used for. And they was, I mean, we were setting them up for failure. So that really wasn't scaling well for us. And 
developers also wanted to try out a lot of new things. They wanted to experiment, right? Uh, I think um, Kiran was the one who was talking about operations don't want to change their stuff because if it works, you want it to continue working. But developers constantly want to change, try out the new uh, so I mean new tools that are being released or new stuff that are being out in the market, and they weren't able to keep up. So this was the ad hoc request part. Every time somebody wanted to try out uh, some tool that's out there in the big data platform, in those times it was like every day some tool was coming out. Every big company was releasing an open source tool. And we weren't able to manage, uh, I mean the operations team wasn't able to catch up or manage those things. So what we started doing was, uh, the ops team started working with the devs, so that they can take care of some of the chef cookbooks or recipes to manage their own infrastructure. And that's when we had this moment, aha moment, where devs didn't really like the Ruby code. Even for somebody who didn't come from a Ruby background, just by looking at the way the operations team were writing code was, no, this is not how you write code, your abstractions are fundamentally wrong. Why do you have a global variable written that you could have just put that inside your function? And a lot of such things, right? Devs had a lot of things to say about the whole operation setup, the scripts that we used, how we used to run them, and all of that. And that sort of led us to the next stage, the growth stage. Um, this time, the overall goal, based on the previous learnings, was to have a decentralized access to our infrastructure. Uh, we were around, by this time, we were growing to 15 to 30 member engineers. We are no longer developers, I will talk about that why. Uh, and then we had two to three ops engineers also on the team uh, and their primary responsibility was to continue where they left off, educate developers on their own infrastructure. Now instead of earlier when we started off, we had only one or two devs uh, taking ownership of trying to experiment with the infrastructure but then we realized that it made a lot of sense if individual teams start managing their own infrastructure. So we wanted to sort of educate developers how, how does this thing work, how do you manage the resources on AWS and so on. And then the operational team worked on the overall process or a sort of a framework for how do we do operations. And that also sort of drove a choice of tools. Uh, we moved from a chef based, a centralized uh, chef server based model to Ansible, which is a pull, which is a push based mechanism where individual teams had their own set of playbooks, roles that they had to manage, uh, and they would have their own CD pipelines which will set up, uh, bring up the instances whenever they do deploys, uh, provision the instance, deploy their code, and so on. And the key important lesson is, I would like to quote from a paper on uh, which came out in 2007. It's from a guy called James Hamilton. He's uh, part of the Windows services team. So the quote is like, if the development team is frequently called in the middle of the night, automation is most likely the outcome. Devs don't like to make repeat, don't like to you know do the repeated task over and over again. Uh, and based on my personal experience, that's so true. But if the operations teams are woken up because they don't have much context on some of these things, they'll say, "I just need you need more me more people on the team so that I can learn, get some KT, and start working on them." Now that doesn't really scale well when you have more number of people, and your obvious choice is, "Okay, I need a big SRA team or I need a big operations team." Um, I mean, this is from a paper called on designing and deploying internet scale services. Uh, you should check out this paper if you are serious about DevOps, it has a lot of really cool insights. Um, I will also share a link at the end of the slides. So one of the key lessons was, some developers when they started doing operations, they loved to contribute to them. Uh, some of the initial things that Ayush talked about, the Matsya Vamana uh, and a bunch of other stuff on OSS.index.com was from developers who were asked to manage this set of infrastructure and then they had to like it started off writing some bunch of uh, cron jobs, or bash scripts, java code, scala code, and then it evolved over time, but it, it solved the problem. We had automation as a likely outcome. And individual teams took care of their own infrastructure and on-call so that they, if you are a developer who pushes a code to production at 12 in the night, you will get a, probably a call at 12 if something is broken. So you have much better context of fixing an issue rather than an ops person who is probably um, sleeping with his wife and waking up and like oh something is down and then doesn't really help solving the problem at hand. Um, and the the downside to that is now everybody has access to infrastructure, everybody can spin up resources, everybody can do whatever they want. Your cost becomes a problem. And from the previous talk, uh, from Ayush's talk, you guys would have realized how we had a sudden spike from more than one fifty thousand dollars a month to suddenly we spiked two hundred to two twenty thousand dollars. And then we figured out a way, we had like a mission cost reduce was the one that we had for almost a month and then we worked like all hands on deck to control the cost 
so that we don't want to spend all the investments that our investors give to AWS. It doesn't really make sense. Um, so the cost control was extremely hard uh, and also super important. And you, if you are giving decentralized access, one thing you should really take into account is a backup. Because, I mean, one case is when I was just getting into this whole ops space, I was trying out a new tool to manage our Route 53 zones and I wanted to import a set of uh, domain names into my zone file, but I ended up replacing my three entries with the whole sort of 50, 60 entries I had. So I, I literally took my laptop, ran to every single member in my office, asked them what are the set of DNS names you have in your bookmarks, just give that to me, I'll quickly add it to my Route 53 and then move on. It was, trust me, it was a very painful experience. And I was thank God I didn't get fired for that. And the first thing I did after getting the infra backup was to have a backup in place. So we have Route 53 backups happening every 30 minutes now. So worst case, you just lose the latest 13 minutes worth of DNS records and we just have to find which pipelines that ran and then rerun them again. Um, and the last, the later stages which we are right now, uh, the goal is continue from where we left off, have a self-serve infrastructure. So that it's, the goal is to be like AWS but internally for the organization. So the users get to manage their own stuff, I mean the developers or the engineers get to manage their own stuff. And we now are 30 to 50 member engineering team but the operational team is still the same size, two to three varying up and down. Uh, and we have a lot of rotation from developers goes into ops and ops comes into development team and so on. And the responsibility right now is to become enablers either via a process or some kind of automation tools so that the engineers can deliver end to end. Uh, we also, and the ops team also wanted to manage, uh, I mean contributes to the design and architecture of the systems so that they don't feel left off. I mean, you, if you're in the ops space, you can only do so much. You can stare at metrics for only so long. You can think about uh, metric collection, log management, instance, cost, only for so much, right? It's some, the domain doesn't change. It, I mean, you can be uh, in an e-commerce domain, you can be in a banking sector, you can be in, in any other different domain, but in the ops space, you are still working with the same instances, same server, it's the same Linux, it's the same container, it's, it's the same thing, in respect of whichever organization you work for. Now, how do you get to explore your catalog of stuff? So, we, we, work, we take the ops team into our architectural designs, uh, discussions, so that uh, they come in with the focus on cost, security, and you know, high availability part. So this also sort of led us to our design decisions apart from Ansible. We moved to a lot of Mesos Marathon stack, which I'll talk more about it. So these are like resource schedulers. Uh, Imran touched a bit about it. Uh, I think everybody in the morning who talked about it talked about resource schedulers. So it really helped us because have, it gave us a unified view of all the underlying resources. As an ops member, I can scale my backend system to any number of instances or trim it down. For developers, it's all about I need 5 GB of RAM or I need 1 GB of RAM and then 1 CPU. That's how it works. But it's very difficult to find an a, an instance on the cloud that manages that instance profile. So how do you keep track of them? It helped, it really helps. And operations became a first class self skill for our developers and development became a first class skill for our operations. Uh, and the operability review, which I'll talk in, in the next consecutive slides is just how one minute, so I just want to rush through. Uh, of, it, it sort of helped us reduce the number of bugs uh, we had uh, before we made the first broad push for any new system. And the downside to all this approach so far, it's been good, but the downside is when you have decentralized access, you give developers to try out new stuff, it gave, I mean, it led to a lot of def, uh, fragmentation uh, in the whole deployment stack because different people wanted to try out different stuff and there was not much uniformity on how systems actually work. Um, so to handle the last problem that I talked about fragmentation, we used this notion called as a tech radar. So tech radar is uh, initially came, uh, I mean at least for me, I heard it from a ThoughtWorks uh, company, company called ThoughtWorks. They sort of publish this I think every quarter or two quarters once on what sort of different techniques, tools, or platforms that they use, what has been successful, what hasn't been, what are their uh, war stories, and all of that. So you have, you know, this is our tech radar from Index, that's sort of open source, that's the link. Um, so you have different categories, like tools, languages, techniques, and platforms. And then we have different categories, like adopt, trial, assess, and hold. Uh, adopt is like, we have run it in production, we know it works, uh, and we just want to continue working with them. Trial is something that we have found it to be really cool and there is one team trying it on a very small subset of systems and likely to see if it works good or not. Assess is something that we have heard really good things about it but haven't really got time to try it out. 
cold is something that we have tried and don't want to use it now because of a set of issues that are associated with them. When you click on each of those uh, items, you will it will expand a description of how it actually works. Um, I just need two more minutes, okay? And the last thing about operability review. Uh, so, I mean, I guess a lot of organizations actually have this notion of a checklist that they maintain before they make their push to production. Um, so this is, uh, I mean, from a conference document of the operability review, the two key sections are, it helps you identify issues before you make the production push for your system. And the other key takeaway is, Every first production push for any new system that's being built has to be, I mean, has to get a seal of certification from the operation team that it has passed or it has been gone through the checklist of operability review. If it is not, such a deployment is not considered production. Even though you call it as prod environment or something, such deployment is not considered production. So, and this also sort of gives chance to the operations team to influence some of the design decisions or the architectural decisions we make in our applications on the aspects of say cost, security, the uh, availability and bunch of other stuff. And some of the points that we cover is the benchmarking or load testing results, the, what are the SLAs do you have, uh, does your system meet, sorry, does your system meet them, uh, do you have a data store like a database, is it a, like a separate MySQL or a RDBMS database. Do you have a separate instance managing it or do you use a service like RDS or is it an embedded database like RocksDB? How do you manage the backup and restore? What are the sort of security policies you have? Uh, I mean, we don't deal with user data, so for us security is more around exposing the system out to the public or not, so it's mostly deal with ports, open ports um, on the security groups. And what sort of scaling policy do you have? How do you do deployments? Is it automated? Is it on marathon stack or is it something that you do manually? Um, and what sort of backup recovery tools do you have for your data store, if you have any? And then what is your monitoring or alerting uh, policies? Uh, what sort of metrics do you want to monitor and get alerts on? And then finally the cost. What are your instance type? How much resources do you need? And then do you have an entry in Plutus so that we can start tracking your costs? So these are some of, and then a bunch of other items that we track as part of the operability review uh, policies. So yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you,